Thanks for your unstenting efforts in this regard. Josh, why don't you go ahead and sit down and we'll open up our um, uh, discussion periods. Um, Lynn, you mentioned um, one of the barriers to patients getting access to pharmacogenetics at your community hospital setting was price and cost. But we haven't really discussed what you're seeing, everyone's seeing out there in the marketplace. What are you seeing typically for a pharmacogenetic test? So a few years ago, they were three to $5,000. Yeah, I don't think there's anything called typical. When I first started, they were $750 for a panel and then went down to 499 and then to 330 and now we can get them for 249 if it's a cash price. So um, they've come down quite a bit in price. Um, $249 out of pocket expense for an underserved individual, yes, definitely it's a barrier, especially if they're Medicare or Medicaid. Um, but we also select laboratories based on not just price and quality, but also based on patient assistance programs. And so the ones that we've chosen to work with have really good patient assistance programs so that if the income is X, all you have to pay is $10. So that works really well in our clinic where we get patients from all over. Um, some will say, oh, yeah, I don't want to go through insurance. Here's $249, pay out of pocket, versus others who say, if, if I can't get this covered, I, there's no sense in me getting this testing done. There's one other component to that, which is uh, in many, if not most, institutions, when it's a send-out test, the laboratory will generally add a multiplier uh, to the cost that the patient actually sees, and that can range anywhere from three to ten times uh, the cost of the test. So a $250 rack price test might be $2,500 uh, with that additional thing. So it's again, the 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 cost is very difficult to get a handle on. So uh, there, there's lots of issues that we really have to pay attention. I see knowing nods from people that have yeah. been down that uh, down that route. And I'll just say, just to so that there's no confusion. Um, we as an institution don't do the billing. It's the laboratory that does the billing. So whatever the laboratory charge is, that's what it is. And we luckily don't have to, it's not institution billed. So it goes to the insurance company. So you, and then Julie. First, uh, just one clarification. I was asked by Dr. Johnson what our number was in 1,200 patients of patients are actually getting a prescription and then having an actionable result. Ours was about 15% in that, so not far off of what Todd's reporting. Uh, my question is around what, what can we learn in the germline pharmacogenomics field from what's happened in cancer? I, three of the presentations we just had talked about foundation medicine. Their test is now in front of the FDA and CMS for clearance, and it's a panel-based test, multiple genes on it, uh, and we've been talking all day about, you know, can we take a multiple gene approach in germline pharmacogenomics? So how is it that the foundation test is being considered like that? where I would argue, you know, I'm a medical oncologist, most of the genes on that panel have much less evidence than what we've been talking about today, and those tests are getting paid for. I've sent them hundreds of times on my patients. All of our institutions are, have homegrown onco panels, and nobody ever asks how those are paid for, and then why, why are we facing something different with, with germline? So let me give you a direct answer to your question of, are we asking if it's been paid for? Yes, we are asking that question. Um, will tell you we're asking a lot more of those questions in terms of what's being paid for and how we're paying for it um, in genomics um, than we have uh, ever have done. And part of the problem in this space is, well, there's three fundamental problems, and we'll talk about a little bit more of this later, but just to give you a synopsis of not only the answer to your question, but some of the fundamental issues, and this will talk to some of the earlier speakers' issues about reimbursement. There is a fundamental issue in this domain around coding I don't mean codeine the drug, I mean coding for reimbursement. Um, you know, we, have, we see, our belief is there's about 65,000 tests on the market. We see about 10 new tests per day. Um, and for those folks that are in the weeds here, there's only about 200 CPT codes. For folks that know what a CPT code is, that's what we will largely pay off. So there is a fundamental mismatch between the number of tests that everyone is working with, and the number of codes that a payer is making a decision on what gets reimbursed. Right? That, that is, the, in my opinion, out of all the discussion I've, I've seen, I've been part of most of it for today, the most fundamental issue that this community needs to resolve is that. Because then we will start paying for things 
in a more precise way with greater accuracy, and we we're going to reduce a lot of friction in the system. The second thing that we worry about to push on the, on the, your, your comment around pharmacogenics is quality. We worry about the vari variability in the wet lab side and the dry lab side of quality. Um, when we think about a lot of these lab tests, it is very difficult to get a measure on what is good, right? We really worry about it on the interpretation side. Um, most of the academic medical centers we've seen in the last eight weeks tell us that they're the best. Uh, I'm sure you're all wonderful, um, but by definition, not everyone can be the best, but that's okay. Uh, so we need to have better measures on quality. So if you think about it, what are the th key themes around the limitation of pharmacogenomics and why aren't more payers paying for it? Number one, you've got to get some lubrication in the system. You've got to get the coding right. We need to figure out a way of solving the coding problem. And when that gets solved for, a lot of these issues will be much easier to address because we can figure out, I've seen this claim come in with this code, this should be reimbursed. Right now, there's only 200 codes, and given how many tests there are, it's very difficult to know. This is the pharmacogenomics test. It maps to this CPT code. We should reimburse for it if we have a policy for it. So what I'm sharing with you is there's a practical issue here. On the foundation medicine piece, those CPT codes are clearer, so it's easier for us to run through our own internal systems. That makes sense to everybody? I cannot stress that enough. If there's one thing this group of people, and you're all super smart folks in the room, if there's one thing that you try and figure out is how do you help solve the coding problem from 65,000 tests to how a payer can actually pay for it, right? Secondly, solve the quality problem. And thirdly, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, is how do you solve the health economics? You know, there is, a, there is an absence of health economics in much of this space. Um, I think there's some work going on. Um, I'd love to le learn a little bit more about it. But we need to get better um, communication to the pairs around what some of the health economics are. For other tests in other areas, that evidence is clearer to us. In this area, I think it's still fairly nascent. So to summarize, coding, quality, health economics. That makes sense? Yeah. The long answer to your question. Yeah. But that drives how we make those kind of decisions. Yeah. So let me, uh, let, it, let me move along, and thanks for that. Uh, the coding and the quality are things that are being attended to um, by ACMG and CAP and, and AMP, so not particularly, um, uh, well, I, they are. Um, so, I mean, we, you can disagree, but that doesn't change the fact that they are actually addressing those issues in as much as they can uh, within the system, and we can talk offline about what's actually happening. Um, but specific to the research questions that are really, uh, and the implementation questions that are, um, uh, you know, relevant here, I think the, the economic piece, which we'll hear some more about tomorrow, is relevant. But I think, Scott, to answer your question a little bit more directly, which was about the differences, there are also some uh, issues about tests that are brought to market as laboratory developed tests, which don't undergo an FDA approval process, but can still go out into the market versus those that are submitted for FDA approval that can either go through a full approval process or if they look vaguely like another test can go through an expedited 510K process. So there's different ways to get to the market and there's inequity on the uh, test developer side in terms of do we really go the full FDA route versus if we can get into the market and uh, decrease our cost. So that's another big issue that's being talked a lot about in, in, the, in the laboratory community. So Julie, I think you were next. Yeah, and so um, perfectly situated, it was a cost question. So Josh, um, on one of your slides, you had a list of, where is Josh? It's like right between me and this camera. <laughs> um, you had a list of, I think, reasons that physicians did order or did order the tests. So at the at the top was something about evidence, at the bottom was about an alert. You know what slide I'm talking about? So number two on the list was absence of out of patient out of absence of out of pocket costs for the patient. So I, I, I again, you know, just sort of thinking about this, you know, this is a real barrier if the only way it's attractive to physicians if it's it's free because it can't possibly be sustainable if it's free, right? So again, there's this artificial thing that's been created in some ways by the grant funding, but it's not sustainable and it's not scalable. 
Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a question for you or if it's just a question for all of us. How do we get, how do we get past that where, you know, physicians only value it if it's free, but otherwise they worry about it? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, it's obviously a bigger question, but it's a huge point. I mean, and, and so internally, um, that was at a time in which it was all paid for in our institution before we started switching to um, uh, billing in, uh, insurers for the test. And um, uh, as with you, I think we found that there's reasonable um, reimbursement for that, but then there's just a variety, just as Lynn has talked about, sort of a variety of um, potential costs and even a couple hundred dollars. Um, $200 um, uh, could be a lot if the patient doesn't have, you know, the wherewithal to pay for it. Um, I think it's the, um, but in, you know, our perspective, it's almost more the uncertainty about knowing what will happen, I think, that drives some of that as opposed to uh, you sort of know exactly what's going to happen with the CBC or any other sort of standard tests. And, and you know that you know, if they don't pay for it, it'll be a pretty cheap cost and things like that. You know, the pr provider generally doesn't know what a, what a test costs. And in this environment, this could be an expensive test. So there becomes a, more uncertainties about things like that. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. And I think a lot of times whenever we say genetic, everybody automatically assumes it's thousands of dollars. Um, but uh, Josh Peterson, in, in his work, is beginning to incorporate some willingness to pay analyses, and I think we also need to look at um, other approaches like value of information analysis uh, to really start to get at some of these questions about w where w do we really need to be positioned uh, to be able to have something where we could check off some of those things and eliminate some of those cost concerns as being the primary driver. The inequity of healthcare services is, is uh, manifest across all um, uh, the issue is it's not specific to genetics, but at least if we can get some specific information on that, that should be something that should be included in further economic analyses. I had Heidi next. So I, I did want to go back to some of John's points because I think they are really critical for us to actually proceed with implementation, and that is around the coding question and the quality of interpretation. On the coding side, you know, I think or mainly organized by AMP, there has been efforts to develop new codes, but it's been incredibly slow. And I think some of the barrier is, is just getting the volunteers within the community together to come up with appropriate codes. Um, but, but I've seen it work well where, you know, I was part of a, a few different groups that came up with hearing loss codes and cardiomyopathy codes. And the idea was, not to come up with a code for every test, because there's just too many tests that will continue to be iteratively developed with small incremental changes, but to come up with codes that can be generically applied to say, all right, if this is the broad indication, let's say hearing loss, you need to test at least these 10 genes, but it could be 10 or it could be 100 or it could be anything above 10. This is the minimum to make it a clinically useful test if a lab wants to add as many as they want, that's up to them, and this code is okay to use for all of these different. So I think incumbent upon this group in pharmacogenomics would be bringing together a group that can say, okay, here's some, not completely generic, but slightly more generic code sets to be used in pharmacogenomics that doesn't require a brand new code every time somebody makes you know, a minor SNP change to a test and that can be applied broadly. And I think that that would help you know, the transparency and the coding process without an enormous burden of a new code every time somebody launches a test. So, so that's one thing that I think this group could help with implementation is actually to help with that code definition, uh, working with existing efforts that AMP and others are leading. The other thing is around the accuracy of the interpretation, which is extraordinarily hard to objectively deal with. And I would argue that no one is really tackling it, with one exception. <laughs> And I obviously am a bit biased as a PI of ClinGen, but um, I have watched extraordinarily uh, or extraordinary improvement in the quality of interpretation from laboratories submitting to ClinVar. A couple of labs that, you know, that I won't name, but I don't think did a very good job. And when they started submitting to ClinVar, there was a bit of an out of the problems. But it made a huge difference in them changing their practices. In one case, going to their CEO and saying, we need to actually hire people who know what they're doing because we just really messed up here. Um, and I, I've also seen, and this is you know somewhat anecdotal, but it's been validated by many of my colleagues, a correlation between quality and whether you submit to ClinVar at all. 
Um, and so I would argue that simple requirement of submission to ClinVar to create a transparent peer review of your own interpretations has a huge improvement in the quality of interpretation. But I can tell you that having gone to CAP multiple times to say, please put this in as a quality assurance requirement, just like all of our labs have to check temperatures on every PCR machine and every freezer and eight million things I do for quality assurance reasons that probably have little to impact the quality of my test. That is one that I think has a huge impact, yet CAP has, has not agreed to do this. So I think it's gonna have to come from the healthcare providers and frankly, the insurers. And the biggest movement I've seen beneficial is when Aetna required laboratories to submit to ClinVar to reimburse BRCA2. All the laboratories all of a sudden submitted on that gene. Um, and I think the insurers are the best to <laughs> push this issue because I haven't succeeded in getting CAP to do it. Great. I think there was a uh, question. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Melissa Clark from Howard University. Uh, so in listening to some of the presentations, there, there were some cost data um, and cost effectiveness data in some testing arenas. And so I'm wondering if anyone, especially those who might be from accountable care organizations, have been looking at the idea of using uh, pharmacogenomic testing as sort of a loss leader, um, absorbing that cost and seeing what kind of effect that can have prospectively on your cost as an ACO, either you know, on your own as an ACO or in conjunction with a payer if a payer is partnered with you. Not everybody at once. I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think the, um, the challenge uh, as we've thought about this is, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the confounders. Um, you know, it's, it's the, particularly for people that are on a lot of medications where they're more likely to have a pharmacogenomic benefit. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of different things that are happening, a lot of heterogeneity. So I think it's, it would be difficult to capture the data. The only group that I know of that is doing, um, well, I don't think they're capturing the outcomes data, so I'm not sure I, I know. I probably, Josh, do you want to comment in terms of how, whether or not this is something, and you know, all of us that are capturing the outcomes, I think, are dealing with this, this issue, but in terms of being able to sell that as this is, you know, um, the, using a loss leader concept, I think that's a little bit different. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a lot to add to that. I mean, we're certainly, we're modeling it, but you know, it still has a, uh, I should say, by we, Josh Peterson, but um, you know, it still has a cost and, 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 um, and, and there's some cost per outcome and uh, you know, the, um, whether or not it actually leads to a, an actual difference. We haven't actually talked about it um, with insurers across a, a group. Um, it is interesting though that, that we have these visions of how things like this could work across a network of hospitals. And we certainly are thinking about it, but we haven't had those discussions that I'm aware of. Well, I think one of the examples that I heard earlier, um, I believe there was a, a quote of a 4% um, potential avoidance in readmissions for those individuals on Plavix. I mean, that would be, you know, for example, a cost model that could be expanded to look at, okay, if the hospital prospectively paid for this, how much would be saved in the, in the readmissions rate for adverse drug events or, or failure of therapy? And that particular example, for instance, is built into the simulator. And you can, you know, try different things. And actually, I think that might have been on one of my slides that um, I actually did do an observational study, a cost effectiveness study to say, okay, if we had to test um, in, in patients, all 1,400 patients, and compared that to the amount of money we were spending because these were 30-day readmissions, you know, would we at least break even? And, you know, there's a lot of assumptions you have to make in that. And with those assumptions, you know, I had evaluated that we would even be ahead by 50K. Uh, now what they're asking me to do, and, and rightly so, is to have their cardiology decision support people within their own cardiology group, identify the patients, go through the medical records, and look to see if those um, cost savings and expectations and estimates 
you know, are still on target. Um, but I still think that until they see the data on what the testing helped them do, they, because there's, it is multifactorial and there's other reasons why a patient may not have, you know, may have gotten another MI. Um, a lot of the work in that area is um, how you define a failure, a Plavix failure. And so a stent that's been thrombosed as a Plavix failure, that's, that's one component. And asking Lori about that in some of her studies, it is a small component. But what about the MIs and what about the strokes? And so people are also defining failures differently. And so the economic analysis um, is different based on what they're considering a failure. And I can't stress enough the, this behavioral economics um, idea of why we make the decisions that we make as physicians, as patients, et cetera, in terms of you know, what we're looking at, what is our cost benefit. So even when you give numbers, it doesn't always motivate someone to make a change. Yeah, I think the other thing to remember is that avoided cost sometimes is also avoided income uh, from the hospital perspective. I mean, that's the perversity of our system. The, the patient that Josh uh, presented, we got, they, they got paid for all those stents. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we have real issues uh, uh, depending on your perspective. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my talk tomorrow about how different perspectives gives you different answers. So I'm going to go to Todd and then to Howard and then to Julie. Okay. <clears throat> I think the discussion that Lynn brought up and what we were just having is, is really relevant. It, it, what do we really, you know, what, when you say you want to cost uh, uh, estimates or analysis, <clears throat> being a pharmacogenomics guy, when we first started talking about, uh, you know, we we're going to do a cost-effective analysis, well, you then realize what that means to a geneticist is completely different than what it means to an economist. Cause we engaged in economists and within the Ignite Network when we were, we got the data from the clopidogrel study, it's like, okay, let's do a cost effectiveness analysis on it. Well, we had like 12 different opinions as to what that cost effective analysis really was. Um, and it, it's different with, you know, between economists and, and geneticists um, and it's even uh, different within. So I think any sort of guidance that we can get from uh, you know, from whether it's insurance companies or uh, CMS or whoever, as far as how we really should run the trials, mm -hmm. you know, for some of these things. Do they, do they mean cost of illness? Do they mean cost to prevent a death? Is it go greater than one year? Or are you only interested in, you know, up to one year because of their... So I think there's a lot of things like that that, you know, and I think a collaboration with us, with any of the payers would be really helpful in trying to so we can understand what it is that we really want. And it goes back to designing the clinical trials. We were talking about what clinical trial do we really want. Well, it depends on what the question is and what the really endpoints are. I agree. So we've had a, Moffitt's had a cannibal care organization that's oncology specific for the last four and a half years. And so in that context, we use pharmacogenomics a, a lot because we're in shared risk models. And we, in that model, could almost care less about CPD codes because you're holding the risk uh, jointly with United or whoever else the partner is, but it's a, it's a very different dynamic. And so it's very much, is the testing gonna avoid an event uh, that is both bad for patients and bad for the bottom line? And having both of those things is a real uh, stick and carrot to make change happen. So a, a uh, myeloid leukemia patient that gets a fungal infection costs us $29,000 extra in the first year to manage. We lose $29,000 a year giving someone an event they don't want that can often be fatal. So lots of incentive to not do that um, as opposed to, you know, the Josh Ginny model where you want to give nine stints to everybody. No, I'm just sorry, Josh. Um, the, but the idea that, that one could get in that situation for that. And, and so it's been quite valuable. When we go into price our bundles, we can go in and say, well, a breast cancer patient who gets neuropathy from taxanes costs $8,000 a year to, more to manage than a breast cancer patient without neuropathy. Let's model that and do preemptive uh, work to try to avoid that. So it, it changes that dynamic a lot and becomes institutional value becomes more important than insurance company value um, or these other things. And so I, I think you know, we we'll probably won't get to a time when it's all accountable care, you know, stuff, nor will we get to a time where it's zero. 
but it, it definitely has introduced a, a greater appreciation in our leadership of why pharmacogenomics can be valuable to them now and later. Julie. Well, and I, I think the thing that always gets lost in, in the conversation um, and in the clopidogrel example, some of the events that you didn't capture are death. I mean, and we know that from the, from the larger IGNITE project. And of course, in an economic analysis, I mean, that's a cheap outcome. And so, you know, going back to Mr. Anderson's presentation, you know, we cannot lose the patient at the other end of this, and death is the worst outcome. And, you know, and our economic models don't necessarily put value on that. And, you know, so how we start to pay better attention to the outcomes that these patients are experiencing um, and not just the health economics part, I mean, I think is, you know, again, part of this culture shift, and, and it's, not just, it's not just in pharmacogenetics, it's in all of healthcare, but, um, you know, a fair portion of the events that we saw in the clopidogrel study, which Laurie will present, were deaths. Um, so, you know, we just can't forget those. So I had a question for Nick, um, and this is um, relevant to some of the work that um, uh, we've been doing in Emerge and others, where we actually have some longitudinal information on, uh, on patients. And I was thinking about your exceptional responder um, study and thinking about ways to identify those patients out of transactional electronic health record data. And it seems to me that if you have a longitudinal record, the good news is that we have pretty specific codes for things like metastatic breast cancer, that type of thing. And so in going retrospective, you could presumably identify a cohort of patients with that code and then look to see who's still around after uh, a set period of time. And I'm wondering if you've been um, using that type of a method or uh, whether that would be something that uh, uh, we could take advantage of some of our um, uh, uh, collaboratives that, are, that have uh, electronic health record data where we could potentially identify those for, a, uh, for some type of a, of a research-related question. I think that's a great idea. Um, one proxy that we've used for uh, exceptional responses, so you mentioned you know, how long they've been alive how, or how long they've had that code. So that's one, but, but when you're looking at a specific exceptional response to a specific drug, um, we've you know, had definitions per subtype of metastatic breast cancer for how long you're on a particular drug that might be an outlier. You know, so in certain subtypes, if you're on a particular drug for more than two years, that's pretty unusual. And so you could do a pretty quick search that way in, in longitudinal eMERGE data with codes. Um, so we've talked to some, we've talked to um, some folks that have had that type of electronic data, but I don't think we've ever talked to eMERGE about that. That would be a really a good uh, discussion to have. Howard. You, you end up finding some uh, very uh, unusual practice patterns as well, especially in a tertiary center. You know, we've had patients who have been on so we've done this in the context of tyrosine kinase inhibitors and found some patients who have been on the drug for m several years. Uh, four or five months into their treatment, the drug stopped working, but the patient felt more comfortable staying on the drug, and so it was continued to be prescribed. And other things were added to it. You know, these types of things which you don't want to find, thankfully it wasn't <coughs> a patient managed at our institution, but you, there's a, still a lot of cleaning that has to be done because in, you know, in the real world you get these uh, unusual things where even though disease might be progressing, uh, there might be another reason to stay on the drug, right or wrong. Yeah, that was $9,000 a month, that one. Mary. I have an unrelated question for Todd. So your 30% of patients who were already on a high-risk drug that had a high-risk genotype, is that the right way to interpret that? No, so that the 25 percent uh, in the graph. So that was uh, of the patients that were that got one of the trigger meds and then were genotype. Um, about 25 percent of them had some sort of an actionable note that was sent back to the provider. And and what accounted for the majority of those? Was that PPIs and 2C19? I mean, was it something that is going to make a big difference or a little difference in clinical outcomes? Um, I don't remember exactly the distribution of those. Um, to be that common, it seems like it must have been 2C19. There, there was some of those um, that I, I would have to actually go back and look. I don't, I don't remember. I mean, there's, uh, uh, I mean, it was a wide variety of. I mean, the, the not even 25% of the 
total prescriptions were PPIs, uh, so it, you know that wasn't the majority of them because there was a really broad distribution. Uh, I mean, there's a fair number of, of pain meds, you know, so tramadol was the the most. Um, there's some you know statins and stuff, so it it, it wasn't dominated by any one uh, specific thing. And we were actually, as we were enrolling, we were a little concerned that we were going to have you know. Uh, uh, the first out of the first 500 patients, you know, 450 of them would be PPIs, but that's actually not the case. It's a pretty wide distribution. Jeff. So I'm I'm wondering um, what we could do with all the wonderful implementation sites and projects that uh, we've heard about today. And you know, I'm impressed as you'll hear about tomorrow what Julie and Lara did with the uh, CIP2C9 teamwork and to aggregate a number of groups that are doing similar things. So <clears throat> I guess the question is, how do we harness the sites that we've heard from today um, to, to band together to build evidence bases, um, to build economic models, to actually drive this over the goal line? Because I think the effort seems to be somewhat distributed and not as coordinated as it possibly could be to have the kind of impact that we want to see. So I'm just curious as to how all of you who have presented today could think about, you know, an, another model that would allow these types of measures to, to ha have impact? I'd say the one thing I think that could help that is what I mentioned earlier about knowing exactly what, you know, where the goal line is that, that we're trying to get to. So what is it that from a, you know, from a cost standpoint or uh, from a, at least a reimbursement standpoint, what is it that we're really you know, need to get done to actually get it to a point where it's reimbursable, which will drive a fair amount of it, if that's the case. Because I'm not sure that, at least, I don't know exactly, you know, what it is from a, the, the cost standpoint, or how many, you know, how many deaths need to be prevented per $20,000 of genotyping or, you know, those sort of things. So uh, that would help, I think. So what you're saying is that even with everybody in the room here, it's an incomplete type of uh, model because we don't have the, the some of the uh, payers or other groups that are going to make, make the decisions. But we saw in, um, in Joss's presentation that right after the American Heart Association meetings, there was a significant uptick in ordering of CYP2C19. So even though that didn't, you know, wasn't, um, you know, necessarily a payer-driven model, the, the provider community really, you know, saw this as valuable. Well, I'm sure there'll be more information tomorrow when we go over the cost effectiveness, but um, some of the things that, that Todd and I have interacted about is that you know, we have a self-insured employee population at Mission, and we have other groups in the area that are self-insured, and, and in trying to pilot out a study to say, well, when you say cost effectiveness, what, what parameters are you collecting? And so for our employee health program, they're really wanting to know, should they be covering a panel of pharmacogenetic tests? And so uh, working with one ohm, we're trying to identify, you know, what is the, what are the different pieces of information? Where do they come from? How do we get it? And, you know, working with you and others to say, well, these are the parameters that we looked at. I mean, total cost of care is kind of huge for me to think about, but having specific parameters to say, how are we going to get this information in and collect it and survey it and then monitor it and evaluate it, um, I don't want to have to come up with my own endpoints, and yet that's what I've been doing, and why haven't I reached out again to talk with you? So I think there should, there can be much more of that. Um, we're all busy and we don't always think about it, and that's why these meetings are so important. Terry. Well, and I might also ad address this issue of what evidence is convincing. It's not only convincing the payers, and, and probably John will, will talk about this a little bit more in the panel presentation, but it's also convincing the physicians, as we've heard around the, around the table. Physicians tend to be convinced by, they say, randomized clinical trials, although more than half of what we do in clinical medicine, probably vastly more than half, has no clinical trial evidence behind it. Sorry. Um, but uh, uh, I, I I think one thing that we, we might want to consider is whether, as, as Jeff suggested, there's a way to bring these QI projects that are already going on in, in hospitals and medical centers around the country to bring them together. And this was actually raised in our eighth genomic medicine meeting um, back two years ago, and, and yet we haven't figured out a good way of doing that. So, so if the collected heads around the room can, can help us with that, that would be, I think, a, a, a tremendous step forward to, to try to uh, harness what you guys are already doing. 
Well, I think uh, one thing that should be mentioned is that there is an ongoing uh, effort uh, between Ignite Emerge and CSER to try and harmonize outcomes that we're all looking at in our different studies. And I think that um, the intent is to have an outcomes repository um, as part of the Ignite program, but with ownership uh, distributed across those groups. But there's no reason uh, that it should be restricted uh, to that, because all of the things that we've talked about, all of you are going to be measuring certain outcomes of care, and you're going to be def defining those outcomes in certain ways. And by getting those out into, um, uh, into the public, uh, then people that want to do a similar study can at least begin to choose similar outcomes. So much as we've uh, you know, looked at promise, for example, for patient-reported outcomes, where we, we're going to land on that set to use across these studies, uh, we could presumably use these types of outcomes across multiple studies, and then at least we don't have to then have the argument about, well, you measured your outcomes this way, and I measured them this way, and how can we actually then reconcile uh, what we think we found? Yeah, um, I've, I've heard a lot of comments about, you know, you kind of want to know where the goalpost is, particularly for pairs. You know, I think that's a question that people ask a lot, and obviously it's often pair specific, but we did a study taking a look at um, many coverage policies um, across large um, private payers, looking specifically at those for sequencing um, based um, test and looking at um, multi-gene panels. And um, payers are still, at least for publicly available coverage policies, they're still making their assessments based on the framework of analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility and still looking at large randomized um, trials or well-conducted observational, large observational studies as the evidence base, going to professional guidelines, health technology assessments, um, the same sort of evidence base um, for their assessments. And it actually complicates things in, to, make, uh, to get a positive coverage decision for multi-gene panels because their view is um, they're still looking at the clinical utility of individual genetic variants and um, actually the pharmacogenetics panels were some of the ones that had the fewest affirmative coverage decisions, um, unlike some other um, gene panels. So it's still, you know, they're lagging behind in sort of the um, assessment of, of these things, but um, again, it's still the, the, the evidence base is the evidence base what people are making, uh, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, deciding about clopidogrel, it's the same evidence base. But if you stick it in a, in a cardiology panel with 50 genes, it's going to make, you know, we might think that that sounds efficient, um, but they're still worried about what are the downstream um, possibilities of having to act on, you know, the 49 other things that you might find in that panel, that there's far less evidence about what to do rather than, sit, you know, uh, 2C19. So that's, that's the story. And, you know, inviting them to the table and having them part of the study design process is certainly uh, an important model, and I, would, I think that we should consider that. Laura. Not to spoil my presentation for tomorrow too much, but one thing I've thought a lot about for PGX while we're trying to look across many different institutions is we tend to focus a lot on outcomes we can measure at the individual level, and then that gets really hard because our implementation is so different and we have all these caveats. I think that we have a lot to learn from implementation science and looking some more at outcomes that we can look at at the institutional level. And I think bringing in the payers who can talk about what sort of institutional level outcomes would be most meaningful to them would be a really great way to sort of engage them in the conversation. What gives you hope about that? What, what's your example of why that? <laughs> well, I'll talk about this tomorrow, but you know, we, um, we tried to do um, a, a project looking at response to CDS um, and trying to compare it across institutions and we, we're pulling our hair out so we can't make this comparison and this isn't valid because we look at this and we sort of rolled back and, and made some conclusions and then I started reading the implementation science literature which sort of made all the conclusions. If I'd read the implementation science literature more carefully before trying to do that project, I would have come to all these conclusions before we tear, tore our hair out for seven or eight months. So, you know, but it's, it's tough, but I, I think there are some institutional level outcomes that we tend to overlook that, that could be meaningful and can help synthesize these really different projects that we're doing across lots of different sites. I mean, in some ways, um, we have a model out there, um, and, and that's uh, PCORI, 
um, because PCORI, as part of their investment, invested in, in a methodology um, um, service where they have a, a, an aggregation of methodologies that if you apply for PCORI funding, you're expected uh, to identify methodologies that are already represented there uh, to, that you're using and that you're mapping to, uh, or to provide justification why the methodology you're using, you're using because it's not there. And they've also invested in developing new methodologies as part of their, uh, they've funded researchers to research new methods. And so uh, it's an interesting model. Um, it's not one that I'm aware of that has really been used in other funding sources, but uh, it is a way that they've tried to be, uh, get some consistency across the tremendously uh, heterogeneous projects that, uh, that they're funding. So I think it's a, it's a valid point to at least think about. Mary. So in terms of thinking about a big project that we as a community could take on, I guess I, I go back to the Vanderbilt story where you looked at your 53,000 patients, whatever it was, and you, you had real data on what percent of them received a high-risk drug and real data on what percent of them had a high-risk genotype. We, we might quibble with exactly what those genes or drugs were, but let's, let's say we, we could do that again, at least really carefully catalog the drug use in big groups of patients. What, was, what were the criticisms that you got of that? I mean, it seems to me your conclusion was that you saved uh, 383 serious adverse events you could have saved had you genotyped prospectively and acted on it. Right. We don't need to genotype 53,000 people to know what their genotypes are going to be, right? We can use all the population data that's available and estimate the frequency of all of the serious um, actionable variants in actionable genes. Can we merge those estimates with real data on drug use in these large populations to come up with additional estimates of how many bad events are prevented and thereby avoid doing another negative, poorly planned clinical study? I mean, I'm just curious, what kind of pushback do you get on when you state that, um, that finding that you saved so many serious adverse events, because to me, that seems really impressive. You genotyped well, people, it didn't cost that, you that much money, and you saved hundreds of patients from having something bad happen. I mean, what more do we need to see? It's an inter interesting, uh, interesting question. I mean, that was published a couple years ago. The, um, uh, so I can tell you within Ignite, we are doing a, another ecological study that we're currently looking at. I think we've changed the name of that actually again now that I think about it. But the, um, <laughs> yeah, the CPIC prescribing study, the, um, um, where we're looking at um, uh, the same sorts of things across um, a, a broader, you know, group of um, hospitals. And we certainly would, you know, others can join too. Um, and um, the, uh, with that, um, we could do the same calculations for, um, you know, to uh, calculate adverse events and, and what the potential outcomes would be. Um, hopefully you tell the story of our larger community, maybe it becomes more convincing. Uh, and perhaps even with, you know, maybe that can be intersected with some of these, you know, cost effectiveness models where you could, you know, even for a subset of those, maybe we could actually, you know, put some data behind, uh, behind some of those questions around, you know, other corollary questions like cost effectiveness. I don't, um, we haven't thought about those next steps, but I think it's important to bring up the question now and, and, and start to, to think about what they are. You know, one of the comments, um, there, there, one other comment I want to bring out, um, uh, Heidi mentioned sort of the, the multiplex um, pharmacogenetic testing question. We actually did submit a CPT code early in Ignite, maybe our second year in Ignite or something like that or some, uh, or, um, uh, for that. It was, I, uh, uh, it was up to me to argue and I didn't do a very good job arguing its, its existence uh, apparently. But the idea was um, for a panel-based test that had minimum criteria in the very same way we said, you know, six genes that had to be tested and um, that would have pharmacogenetic indications with evidence. And um, the uh, uh, panel just didn't feel like there was enough evidence um, to recommend a, a, this sort of, uh, this combined panel prospective test. Um, 
And uh, there's a lot of reasons why that's hard, but part of the reason why is there's not a lot of studies out there to support it. Um, the study that I talked about, I think, is one of them, and that's one of the things that led to the CPIC prescribing study that we're undertaking now at Ignite, is to try to say across the community, there really is the advantage. In fact, in that study, 14% um, of the people had four drugs um, that they were exposed to. So, so, you know, basically one fourth, you know, one out of four people that get one, get four. So, um, uh, so there is an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to, to test. I guess the hard data to get is, are the drug prescribing data. Yeah. But now a lot of you in these large centers and um, healthcare systems have data on thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. Well, and the, and the pharmacy, pharmacy benefit, benefit managers have millions. Yeah. Of, Can of, you get access to it, though? Yeah. Uh, a lot of that is publicly available. So. Um, uh, we we've, uh, are working with an economist that's actually used that publicly available uh, data to do some work. We're now using it on, on our own. But yeah, it, it is out there, can be used, um, um, and I think you could probably answer uh, some of those questions. I mean, Josh's uh, point about arguing to the CPT committee, having done that myself, it's a very idiosyncratic process. And it's, uh, it's uh, generated by, uh, that most of the CPT panel are surgeons. Uh, so it's uh, it, it just has it's the way it's set up and it's under the control of the AMA and so the decisions that are made are not always uh, uh, particularly uh, rational. So I have uh, in in the back and then I have Todd and then I have Heidi and then I have. Okay. So you asked the question about uh, what what made um, this researcher hope, hopeful, and I would say about getting payers at the table. I would say payers are people too, um, and. Um, uh, we had a positive experience here in, uh, in D.C. We looked at a cohort of about 180 patients on buprenorphine who were not adherent as judged by urine tox. And we did um, CYP3A4 testing on them and were able to show that with pharmacogenomic testing, uh, guiding dosing recommendations, that there was increased compliance with their buprenorphine regimen. And we were able to successfully uh, lobby the Medicaid agency in the city to change their prior au authorization around that medication. And uh, our next step is really to see whether Medicaid will actually now cover the cost for testing for all buprenorphine patients. So um, there's hope, even with small cohorts. My question was why was she hopeful that implementation si knowledge of implementation science would have resulted in better outcomes or? Because it does. No, uh, <laughs> it's axiomatic. No, Todd. I think uh, you know another thing we don't want to underestimate is the fear of the providers for the liability of uh, the genotype data being available <clears throat> to them. I mean, right now there's a lawsuit against Quest for um, you know for uh, somebody who was genotyped and uh, they weren't acted on apparently appropriately based on there was apparently two publications. I don't know all the details, but it's. It sounds like way less information than there is available on a lot of these other things. And uh, I mean, very often, you know, there is a lot of fear among uh, physicians. Like, okay, so maybe I now know how, what to do with 2D6 and codeine if that's the drug I'm giving them. But uh, you know, if I later give them some of these other ones, what is what is their real liability? What is their chances of being, uh, you know, sued for that? Um, and some sort of clarification other than. Me saying, well, it's usually the you know the guidelines from the expert societies and stuff. That's not very reassuring to them. And some sort of hard evidence or hard document or something that clarifies that, I think, would be very helpful. Yeah, I think liability is an interesting beast um, because clinicians are three times more comfortable with um, an error of omission versus an error of commission, and some of it has to do with the attribution uh, of that. But you know, the the adverse event. Is um, you know, is real for the, again, as Julie said, for that patient. Whether we omit something that we should be doing or commit something, and it would be my argument that it's not going to be too long that we're going to see a stent patient like Josh's saying, "Why didn't you do this test?" Because the the evidence is out there. So um, you know, it's 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 a comfortable barrier to hide behind, but I think it's 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 one that's intellectually not defensible particularly if we take a quality and safety approach to this because, again, they would never make that argument for a drug-drug interaction. They would never make that argument for an allergy. And I think we need to push back pretty strongly when we hear that. I think I had Heidi and then I have Julie. 
So I just wanted to go back to Josh's example. So although I, I understand your argument for the utility of a multiplex panel. No, 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 I'm saying I, I, I understand it, although I can see why insurers are still, you know, not convinced. But my argument wasn't actually around um, arguing the utility of a multiplex panel. It was actually to say, if we can define the, the drug indications um, and, and where there is actual, you know, clear utility, you know, from CPIC guidelines, et cetera, even if it's just for one drug, but then the idea is that the code says at least this marker, uh, and then it's up to you if you want to, for the same price, throw in a hundred more. Because today, for most of the platforms we work on, it's not much incremental additional cost to throw in the rest of the entire panel for the cost of the few SNPs you're doing for whatever drug. And, and we at, at Brigham and Mass General worked with, uh, we meaning the pathology departments, worked with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield to define 20 cancer genes that there was felt to be sufficient utility that that would be paid for in a price determined around those I think it was 20, and I don't know if you were involved in this, Nick, um, genes. But then they agreed that we, you know, we could add as many other genes as we wanted as long as the price didn't change. And that that code could, you know, could be applied for the set that was, had utility and documentation. But it was, you know, up to us to continue to add whatever we wanted and, and that would be ir irrelevant. So that's the kind of argument I'm making is you define your code based on what is clinically defined as useful. But the labs can keep adding content to their heart's delight as long as the price and reimbursement doesn't change, which is what is, should be controlled by the insurance and you know, utility questions. Does that make sense? We need some data around, is there, are there any real downstream costs? The, the pushback is always, are you willing to pay for all the stuff you're gonna now find with the extra content? But I've yet to see data, nor have we created any of our own, to show that it does or doesn't create extra cost. And you know, there'll, there'll be the unusual patient there, but just like with imaging, you find that unusual blip. But um, you know, there's always that pushback. You know, yeah, you're gonna do a panel, you're gonna find a leaf from any syndrome, now we have to scan them for, well, do all these extra things and, you know. Right, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, but there, there's that acute argument. Our approach to insurance companies, and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but our approach has been, only look in the first 12 months it, because after that, the patient may have switched to a different insurance company. So in that 12-month window, are there a bunch of extra things that we've added that would harm the insurance company? And that, that's, that's, as a field, we haven't answered that yet. And I should clarify that it wasn't necessarily agreement that we would return the results of those additional genes. So I, you know, they wanted a very clear protocol around the implementation of this. What was the criteria that patients would get this test that they would then pay for? And making sure that we had a workflow and process to evaluate those patients to make sure they were appropriate for the test. And I, but I think addressing the issue on the downstream end is also important. So what of these genes will you actually give back and what's the criteria to determine that and, and creating that sort of workflow so that it's clear you won't have, you know, just return willy nilly and then all of these downstream things happen, which is unclear. Because it's a very frustrating discussion to have with, uh, I mean, they, we're doing a lot of, of partnered pilots now. Never say the word research with the insurance company. They'll pay for pilots, but not research. Um, so do pilots, but just a, that's always the thing that comes up, is, is well, what costs are we adding? What, what problems are we creating? Yeah, uh, Julie. So just back to the liability thing, I wanted to completely agree with Mark. When we were um, beginning our clopidogrel program, the conversation came up with our interventional cardiologist about what was the liability. And we brought the ethicist in our institution in and we came to the exact conclusion. Um, and, and, the, and the cardiologist actually rapidly agreed, which was the fact that you don't know their genotype doesn't change their genotype. Their genotype is there and the absence of knowledge doesn't protect you. Um, and, and so I agree. I mean, I think if you're getting that, you should push back hard because it's, you know, the, the fact that they don't know it doesn't mean it's not true. I think the uh, concern where I'm getting is not that initial uh, event. It's 
it's the later, if six months later they get, you know, if there was originally a 2D6 encoding thing and then six months later they get clopidogrel and they did not actually look back because we don't have the alert system in the EHR to notify them and then they have an event, it's like, and then they go back, it's like, well, doctor, you should have known because this genotype was in the EMR, <coughs> the EHR, and you didn't do anything about it. So it's not so much liability of the actual, the initial event, it's the getting the alerts and stuff, getting to the patient or to the doctor in time. Yeah, so you can fix that then by just building alerts for all of the drugs in your program, right? That, that alerts when they have the genotype plus the drug? That links up to in real time when yeah. they, and they can get at the data, but uh, it's got to be something that the genotype data has got to be structured in the EMR so they can do it, right? And we, today we can't do that, or we don't, at least we don't, have all of our gen genetic data in a structured format in the EHR so we can actually do that. Eventually, yeah, I agree, but tomorrow, or today and tomorrow, it doesn't work, maybe in a couple of months or something. Yeah, I mean, my view would be is that, you know, you, you, if you can't do that, you don't return. Uh, because I, I think the obligation then is a systematic one because with the, the difference with the g gene the one exceptional aspect of genetic and genomic data compared to most other data is the persistence of the relevance of the information. It doesn't matter if the sodium, you know, is, you know, you're not going to go back to it. You're going to do another sodium. But th for this, I think it's really incumbent uh, on the implementers to build in those systems. And if you really aren't at a point where you can do it, then you can say, well, we're going to return 2C19, but we're, even though we've done this chip, we're going to suppress the rest of those results until we have that infrastructure into place. And that would be the covenant that I would make, you know, with our clinicians. I'm not going to put you in the position of you having to try and remember to go back and, and look. Dan? Uh, just to sort of reiterate what people have said, I, I think the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's great for Julie and Todd and, and Josh to, uh, and Dick and Oli to have systems in place to do this, but, you know, when people move, uh, the question of what does, it, who, how does the obligation follow the person? Does the, does the person take on the obligation of knowing their own genotypes or does, do we think of a way of creating a national infrastructure that allows people to access their data from wherever they are and, uh, and, and access current clinical decision support. So it's easy to say, well, you know, you have 50, 50 genes, let's so just develop 50 pieces of clinical decision support. That's easier said than done, too. But I think that if, if one of the things that comes out of this meeting is thinking about things that we ought to be doing to move the field forward, that is something that seems to me to be a priority. And on that note, we'll draw our conclusion to uh, a close for this particular session. And I would think that ending on a patient-centered note and the fact that the, the, the information has to follow the patient wherever they go is a critically important takeaway. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and all the discussants.